fall break. Do your homework. Get it in by midnight tonight, and then you are free, free, free until, uh, well, for me anyway, until Tuesday. All right, so we ended last time um, talking about uh, vessel disease, particularly, you know, we talked about arteriosclerosis is hardening of the arteries. Atherosclerosis is this um, uh, disease of atheromas where endo endothelial cell damage results in an inflammatory lesion <clears throat> um, that causes basically cholesterol and lipid to build up. And eventually, uh, this atheroma is, is a, it, it triggers clot formation because <clears throat> normally the only thing that red blood cells and platelets should see is endothelial cells because, you know, all the pipes, so to speak, are lined with endothelial cells. These atheromas don't have a complete endothelial cell barrier, so they trigger clot formation. Those clots can either block off that narrowed artery already, or, much is more common, they break off, travel downstream, and then they get lodged in a smaller artery where, you know, the, the clot is too big to go through that artery. <clears throat> so part of atheroma formation is cholesterol. You know, we have found uh, a lot of cholesterol in these atheromas. So very early on, um, uh, scientists sort of figured that there was a relationship between cholesterol level and the formation of these atheromas. And that has sort of panned out because people who have high cholesterol diets um, have a much increased risk of atherosclerosis. So in order to understand the treatment for the cholesterol part of atherosclerosis, we have to know a little bit about how cholesterol is moved around the body, particularly about two lipoproteins that move cholesterol. So high-density lipoprotein, or HDL, is manufactured by the liver, and its role is to move excess cholesterol from the body's tissues back to the liver. Now, cholesterol is sort of a, a difficult thing to get rid of because the kidneys can't get rid of cholesterol because it's a fat. So the only way we have to get rid of excess cholesterol is through the liver into the bile. The bile goes into the intestine, and then the cholesterol, hopefully, stays in the intestine and then is vacated with the feces. Yeah. Are those just too big for the kidneys to get rid of them? Like the filter? No, it's, water, it's the classic water and oil don't mix. So the lipids never come out into the filtrate. Um, uh, so yeah, the, they, the, the kidneys can get rid of a little, but not very much. Because there's no way to, to store lipids in the urine to pee it out. So we have to put it into the digestive tract where there's stuff that'll hold on to it. So that's HDL. So in our atherosclerosis patient, we want HDLs to be high. Because HDLs, that's cholesterol leaving the body. You know, and that's what we want in the patient with atherosclerosis. We want cholesterol leaving, not entering. So the, that's the good cholesterol. LDL, or low-density lipoproteins, also made by the liver, but the opposite role. This is the, uh, the transporter that moves cholesterol from the GI tract or from the liver to the rest of the tissues of the body. So that cholesterol that's ending up in these atheromas was delivered in LDLs. So we want to see LDL be very low and HDL be very high because that suggests that cholesterol is moving from the vessels and out of the body. So that's the profile that we're looking at. We also want to see the total cholesterol be relatively low. So the constellation we're looking for there is a low LDL, a high HDL, and a low total cholesterol. Um, and that's just to reduce the formation of those atheromas, or even better, to actually shrink them. If we can get the cholesterol out of those, um, then those atheromas will shrink and they'll be less of a problem. <clears throat> so this slide just kind of shows that atherosclerosis is at the heart of three uh, or, or multiple uh, vascular diseases or vessel problems. Um, and it comes about because of that same pathway. Atheromas narrow the vessel and can eventually occlude it. So in the heart, when the arteries get narrow, we get angina pectoris, um, which is chest pain that gets better with rest. That's the, uh, the heart is saying, I'm not getting enough oxygen. And that chest pain usually slows the patient down 
and then uh, the chest pain goes away when that increased oxygen demand passes. A myocardial infarction is a total occlusion of a coronary <laughs> vessel. So this is where heart muscle is going to die, like we're going to talk about in a little bit. In the brain, there are also two different versions, an ischemia version and an actual infarction version. So a transient ischemic attack is a reduction in blood flow to an area of the brain. Um, usually it's a result of a partial obstruction of an artery similar to what you'd see in angina. Where a total occlusion of an artery in the brain, we call that a CVA, a cerebrovascular accident. Now why we don't just call it a, uh, a cerebral infarction, I don't know, but we call them CVAs instead. Out there in the peripheral arteries, these partial obstructions can lead to peripheral vascular disease, um, particularly in the legs. And then uh, these atheromas tend to weaken the walls of these arteries. And the aorta, because it has to transmit so much blood at such high pressure, a little defect in the aortic wall can cause a kind of blowout called an, called an aneurysm, which we'll talk about um, here at the end if we get there. So all of these different disorders, atherosclerosis is either the cause of or plays a role in. So this is a big major player in cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis. So how do we treat it? First thing we do, we try to get the patient to lose weight um, and increase their level of exercise because both of those things have shown to reduce the risk of atherosclerosis. Maintaining a healthy weight not only uh, reduces the progression, but it also lowers the risk for the bad outcome. So myocardial infarction, CVA. Uh, we try to get them to lower their cholesterol. Now first we do this with diet. If diet fails, then we'll uh, start putting them on the lipid reducing medications, which work in a number of different ways. But mostly what they try to do is get cholesterol into the bile so that it's exiting from the body, lowering the total cholesterol and the, uh, and the LDL. Sodium intake should be minimized. Uh, hypertension is a risk factor for atherosclerosis. The reason for that is probably the high blood pressures actually damage the endothelial uh, uh, lining, so, which is the initial trigger for, athero, uh, for atheroma. Um, development. I think our internet just came back on. Yes, so it just got my attention. <clears throat> Did you have a student number question waiting? Oh, no, you didn't. Hold on. Start quiz. Okay, it's going up now. So go ahead and get logged in. It appears to be working. And I know I stopped mid sentence. Sorry about that. So the diet changes we go for, um, a, a, obviously a low cholesterol diet. Um, we try to have them avoid uh, the trans fats and the saturated fats. Um, so non-hydrogenated vegetable oils get substituted for hydrogenated vegetable oils, which is all you can buy in the store now. Um, and then increasing fiber intake also lowers LDL. Um, so reduced sodium intake, that has a tendency to reduce blood pressures, which reduces the endothelial cell damage, which reduces the production of atheroma. So it's sort of um, trying to prevent the beginning of that long chain. Control primary disorders like diabetes and hypertension, and stop smoking. Um, the uh, cigarette smoke is known to cause uh, endothelial cell damage. Um, it also causes vasoconstriction, which leads to hypertension which leads to, as we just talked about, um, uh, more endothelial cell damage, so more atheromas. All right, so regular exercise. If the patient has known atherosclerosis and has had a, a, a thrombotic event in the past, at least that's usually uh, the criteria, we'll put them on an anticoagulant. Um, Low-dose aspirin is one of those practically universal recommendations for people uh, over 55. And that's because it reduces thrombus formation by basically making platelets less sticky to one another. So it, it stops that clotting cascade at its beginning. Uh, for a patient who already has atheromas, uh, angioplasty, we talked about that last time, using a balloon to expand um, those uh, clogged vessels. 
Laser angioplasty is newer. This is where a, a little laser is used to essentially burn those atheromas off the wall. Um, stents are those little wire cages that hold uh, uh, occluded vessels open. <clears throat> and then the worst case scenario is the coronary artery bypass graft. So there's two different ways that this can be done. One is to grab the internal thoracic artery, uh, which branches off of the uh, left subclavian artery kind of high up, separate it from the, uh, the wall, and then attach it distal to where the occlusion is. You know, so here's a coronary artery, here's an atheroma where there's a narrow spot. The goal is to get improved blood flow to this region, so the area distal to that uh, partial obstruction. So the artery bypass graft basically um, provides blood distal to it through the arterial system, through that internal thoracic artery. A more common way to do this, though, is from a vein bypass graft. <clears throat> and this is kind of, I think it's fascinating. They'll take uh, your saphenous vein, which is a very uh, straight vein in your leg, and they'll divide it up into however many pieces of vein they need. Um, they'll attach one into your aorta, and then they'll attach the other end distal again to wherever that occlusion is to provide another path for blood to get to this region of the heart. Yeah? Now, do they do anything with the blockage then? No, usually they don't. Because you don't need to, you're bypassing it. So how come they don't just remove that section of artery that contains the blockage? Like that, and like yeah. hook it back up? Yeah. Much, well, much harder and more dangerous to do. This, this is easy. So, but working on the coronary arteries themselves is hard because they're always in motion. So, yeah, it's, it's so easier. I guess if you have this clamped off, then it wouldn't even have any blood until you were all the way done. Right, right, right. Um, so when you hear about, like, uh, double or triple or quadruple bypass, what they're talking about is how many of these were put in. In other words, how many bypasses, how many arteries were bypassed. So, like... In this case, you know, this is a picture showing you the two different versions. But let's say they didn't do this arterial bypass, but this clog was still here. They'd take another piece of that saphenous vein, and they would attach it over here. And that would be a double bypass. If they did that three times, it would be a triple bypass. So that's what they mean by that, is how many vessels got bypassed. Now, what's interesting is this vein, over time, um, takes on the characteristics of an artery. So even though it started out as a vein, because it is experience art experiencing arterial pressures, it grows thicker walls and smooth muscles in the walls, just like an artery would do. So it's sort of a strange transformation that occurs over time from that um, saphenous vein in the leg. So um, this is open heart surgery because the heart has to be open. You know, in other words, it has to be exposed. The heart is open to the environment. But it does not involve cutting into the heart at all. So it's not internal cardiac surgery. It all still takes place um, on the outside of the heart. And often these are done without having to stop the heart. So it doesn't require um, uh, the heart to be stopped and, and perfusion. Now, sometimes if, if they're doing you know, four or five of them, then sometimes they will go ahead and stop the heart and then start it back up at the end. All right. So that's the treatment for uh, coronary artery occlusion. What are the syndromes? There's really two. There's angina, and then there's MI, myocardial infarction. So angina happens uh, you know, when there's not a total occlusion, but a partial occlusion. In other words, the heart isn't getting enough parts of the heart are not getting enough uh, arterial supply. So the first thing you do, you reduce the cardiac workload. So a patient comes into the ER. I'm having a heart attack. Okay, uh, lay down, rest, and by resting, you reduce the workload of the heart and maybe allow um, the, uh, the oxygen that is getting to the heart to be enough, essentially. So rest, upright position. Um, when we lay down, uh, the, uh, the preload increases. In other words, the heart gets fuller before it contracts, and that increases the workload of the heart. So we have these patients up in a chair or up in bed. Nitroglycerin is a vasodilator, so it helps that already clogged artery to dilate, get as big as it can get. Obviously, we check pulse and respiration. We give oxygen, typically, for chest pain. The more oxygen going in, the more oxygen is in the blood. 
the more oxygen that's in the blood, the less blood it takes to supply any given region of the body. So it can mean that uh, uh, enough oxygen is getting to the heart muscle to stop the pain. Um, in a patient who has had angina before, in other words, it's not a new problem, you can repeat the dose of nitroglycerin if the pain doesn't stop. If they don't uh, have a history, then you assume it's a myocardial infarction and you get, you know, emergency medical treatment. You get them to the ER. All right. So, uh, uh, just had a block. Angina <laughs> um, is... Uh, uh, the heart isn't getting enough oxygen. Myocardial infarction is where heart muscle is actually dying. And it's dying because it's not getting any oxygen. So one of those coronary arteries or its branches has been blocked. So a whole area of heart muscle is getting no arterial supply. No arterial supply means no oxygen. And for a busy little tissue like the heart that's contracting all the time, no oxygen for a very short amount of time is going to lead to cell death. So when those cardiac muscle cells die, um, they release their, you know, they pop open. So they release their enzymes into the blood, and those enzymes can be picked up on blood testing, which many of you who have worked out there in the clinical um, region have probably heard about some of those, which we'll talk about in a minute. If you can restore perfusion or arterial blood flow, Fast enough, you can prevent heart muscle from dying, which is very much the current method of treatment for MI. You know, we want to make the, the heart, uh, we want to make the MI as small as possible. Because the larger the area of infarction, the more complications the patient's going to have. So we try to restore blood flow in 20 to 30 minutes. Um, we may even give uh, clot busting drugs to try to make that happen. Because heart muscle does not grow back. Um, muscle is very similar to nervous tissue in that fact. It does not regenerate. So whatever heart muscle dies, it's that part of the heart is never going to contract again. Now, a scar forms, but that scar doesn't contract. So the heart has gotten weaker, less able to empty, less able to contract down in on itself. So... That uh, scarring starts about seven days after the MI, and it completes about six to eight weeks later. All right, so this is a classic MI picture. Here's your left coronary artery. This is the left anterior descending, also called the widow maker, in case anybody has ever heard that. The widow maker, because a big clot here, and you're dead, because the left ventricle stops pumping. And once it stops pumping, obviously, no blood flow to the body means a uh, dead person. All right, so this is almost a widowmaker widow maker heart attack, but not quite, because it missed a branch. But here is our uh, thrombus, and you can see that this artery has no blood in it at all. So it's been, uh, this is an area of infarction. So in purple here is heart muscle that's getting no oxygen, because it was entirely dependent upon this artery right here to get its oxygen supply. Now, surrounding that in blue is what we call the watershed area. This is area that was partially dependent upon this artery, but is also getting oxygen from other vessels as well, which you can sort of, they've drawn some of those in here. So the area of the heart that's going to die is this purple part, but the area that uh, is, is a little starved is going to get inflamed. So another uh, purpose in the way we treat MIs is we're trying to save this rim of tissue from dying too, trying to keep the uh, infarction this small and not uh, this big. So after the uh, scarring has occurred, we get this kind of appearance. So you can see, you know, this is normal healthy heart tissue all around in here, nice and thick, you know, sort of meaty looking, plenty of blood in there. This is the scar. So you can see that through the whole wall of the heart, this used to look like this. So this part of the heart is, can still shorten, contract, but this part of the heart is never going to contract again. It's just going to stay that shape regardless of what the heart is doing. So this is a pretty massive heart attack. You know, this is about a quarter of the wall of the heart has been involved. This patient's going to end up with uh, heart failure because the uh, left ventricle isn't going to be able to pump very well without... Um, that big chunk of uh, heart pumping along with it. All right. <clears throat> so anybody who thinks they're having a heart attack 
should seek medical care because it's not just the infarction that can kill you, it's also the dysrhythmias. When the heart starves for oxygen, its, it's conduction system starts behaving abnormally. So you can, uh, uh, patients, their heart can suddenly stop. That's ventricular fibrillation because the conduction gets discoordinated. Um, <clears throat> so you want to get patients in <clears throat> to medical care. Uh, fibrinolytic drugs are used um, to try to restore that blood flow, bust that clot essentially to get blood flow back there. But it has to be done within the first 20 minutes. So if somebody comes in and says, oh, my heart, you know, I've had chest pain that won't go away for the last four hours, probably too late to do much to help them, except um, look for these dysrhythmias um, and then see how bad the damage is. So the signs of a myocardial infarction, pain, steady, severe, crushing chest pain. It usually radiates into the inside of the left arm and sometimes the left shoulder. Um, pallor and diaphoresis because of vasoconstriction. You know, the heart is panicking, so it's getting the rest of the body to panic too, sending it into that fight or flight response. <clears throat> MIs uh, strike a lot of anxiety and fear into people. And there again, that's because of the, the sympathetic system gets turned on full blast, so people are panicked. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the key indicator for MI versus angina is the pain of an MI does not go away with rest, oxygen, um, and, uh, and being upright like angina usually does. It stays regardless of what you do. Yeah. Are there EKG changes with angina? With angina. Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. It was their first time with mm -hmm. chest pain. And you're trying to decide whether it's like MI chest pain. I mean, well, I guess when they come into the ER, chest pain protocol is chest pain protocol. So they're going to get everything regardless. Right, right. But then when you go and you hook up to their monitor, and depending on like how you have your lead set up, you may or may not see it like depending on where like the heart attack is. Mm -hmm. But... If someone has, or are you just going to see like PVCs with angina? No, angina, you'll see EKG changes until the pain goes away. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the whole point of an exercise uh, EKG. Right. You, if you stress the heart, and that's what causes angina, you will see um, EKG changes. Now, they're not the same EKG changes you see with an MI. Um, like uh, with angina, it's um, the QT elevation, and with MI, it's QT depression. So they're different, but yes, you'll see changes in both ones. So the diagnosis, um, EKG changes, um, which we're not going to get into those because we'll have to talk about EKG and all that, so we're not going to. Just know that there are typical EKG changes that go along with MI. More commonly today, we look at their blood, and what we're looking for is signs that heart muscle has died. Now, anytime a cell dies, it spills whatever it has inside into the blood. So with fancy medical testing that we can do very easily now, we can look for cardiac enzymes and cardiac proteins um, that appear in the blood. So what we see is the pattern is different. So very early on in a heart attack, so within the first couple of hours, we see a spike of myoglobulin or myoglobin, which is a heart protein. Later, then we get a CK, which is another uh, heart protein, CKMB, and the, you know, the list goes on and on. But typically, the diagnosis, the firm, solid diagnosis of an MI is based on enzymes and isoenzymes. So it's based on blood testing. But other things that we're going to look for, uh, electrolyte levels can be abnormal. An increased white count, because that necrosis is going to lead to an inflammatory response. So a leukocytosis, CRP, and ESR. The ABG may be abnormal, um, and uh, the, a Swan-Gans catheter is a way of measuring pulmonary artery pressures, probably beyond our scope here, but that can also help to determine if the heart has been uh, damaged. All right. So MIs are bad enough. The complications, though, are what the patients have to live with, and oftentimes these can be uh, really bad. So occasionally, sudden death. Sudden death is a complication of a myocardial infarction, either from an arrhythmia um, or because uh, the MI involved enough of the heart where it basically has shut down the heart's functioning. No oxygen means no contracting. No contracting means you know, uh, cardiac arrest. Um, so that's one. 
cardiogenic shock can occur if the, um, if the pumping ability of the ventricle has been reduced by the infarction. Uh, that sudden decline in cardiac output will drop blood pressure, it will drop perfusion, and that leads to shock. So unconsciousness, pale skin, um, a, a rapid, thin uh, pulse. And then one we're going to talk about more here is congestive heart failure. So one of the leading causes of heart failure is MI. You know, you have an MI, part of your heart muscle dies, the heart is no longer able to keep up with the body's demands for cardiac output, and you have congested uh, heart failure, which is a real bear to treat, as we'll see here in a little bit. All right, so for the MI, what do we treat with? We start with the same stuff as angina, rest, oxygen, analgesics. Typically, the pain of an MI does not go away with morphine. So it's one of the quick tests to see, is it musculoskeletal? Is it um, heartburn pain, or is it really an AI? So, heartburn pain will go away? Huh? Heartburn pain will go away? Usually with morphine, heartburn per so pain will go away. So morphine for the MI, are we just giving that to, to open those vessels more? Um, it is both, it's both diagnostic. In other words, if the pain goes away with morphine, it's probably not an MI. And it also calms the patient down, which lowers the workload of the heart and lowers the oxygen need. So yeah, um, morphine is often on the standing orders for, uh, for chest pain, yeah. Uh, anticoagulants, like I said, to try to bust that clot. Uh, we talked about that already. <laughs> um, after an MI, um, most, uh, the recommendation is to get into some kind of a cardiac rehab program. And this is to try to improve the functioning of the rest of the heart that was not affected by the MI. The idea here is <clears throat> if you strengthen the rest of the heart, then the part that's missing uh, won't matter as much. You know, so we put people on an exercise regimen. You know, they basically do cardiovascular training to try to improve the efficiency and quality of the rest of the heart so that they can survive longer without heart failure missing a, a, a contracting piece of the heart. All right, so did everybody answer the student number question? I got 10 out of 11 here. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay, who don't I have? I have 9, 6, 5, 10, 3, 11, 12, 13, 2, and 4. <laughs> who did I not call? Huh? You don't have 14? I don't have 14. Can you put it in again? Is it not going in? Oh, now I've got you. It'll pop up here in a minute. There we go. It's because I haven't sent the question yet. I was getting the student. I was getting student numbers. Oh yeah, the timer's running out. It it starts automatically. Now here comes the question out through the wonderful land of Wi-Fi. Okay, what will a partial obstruction in a coronary artery likely cause? I sent the question here. There. There. Now it went. I put tricky ones on the homework on purpose. Like I don't know the answer, and I looked in the book and it didn't. Okay, let's finish up this one, and then we'll. What's it about? I don't know. It's number eight. Vascular effusions and infarcts frequently occur in the smart hands. Uh huh. And the answers are the regular ones are abnormally large, which they're not really large for human. They're abnormally shaped, shaped, right? Eh. Increased hemolysis of the erythrocytes occur. Erythrocytes change shape when hypoxia occurs, which is true. Uh -huh. And the hemoglobin is unable to transport oxygen, which is a cause for recurrent infarcts. Which, which is not true in sickle cell. It can carry oxygen is fine. It just gets into the wrong shape. So the answer there would be the one about change shape. Yeah. But this one says the deoxygenation of hemoglobin may occur in the peripheral circulation if the oxygen content of the blood is gradually reduced. Leading to repeated minor infarctions. 
Right, but that doesn't have to do with the, sh with the hemoglobin. That has to do with not having enough red blood cells. So deoxygenation causes the hemoglobin to change shape, and that change in shape causes an, uh, many infarctions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's B or it decides to change shape when you're oxidated? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got it. All right. What does the term arteriosclerosis specifically refer to? That's really from last time. Oh, sorry. Jumping it uh, back. The correct answer there is C, angina attacks. A total obstruction would cause an MI. Um, partial obstruction is going to cause angina, which comes and goes, depending on the workload of the heart. OK. What does the term arteriosclerosis specifically refer to? All right, jump in there, last uh, person. OK, so the correct answer here is C. I want you to know the difference between arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis, because even medical professionals out there in the world use these terms interchangeably, or they use the wrong one. And they're not the same thing. So if somebody says, this patient has a high cholesterol, and that makes them have atherosclerosis, you should say, no, high cholesterol is associated with uh, atherosclerosis, not arteriosclerosis. So they are two different things. Arteriosclerosis is hardening of the arteries, happens to everybody with age. Atherosclerosis is related to endothelial cell damage and the buildup of these cholesterol plaques called atheromas that leads to um, uh, coronary artery disease, uh, uh, cerebral blood flow disease, um, and peripheral vascular disease. So be sure to tell them apart. So A is atheromas, um, let's see, and ischemia and necrosis is, uh, is not common in the brain, kidneys, and heart in arteriosclerosis. In atherosclerosis it is, but arteriosclerosis doesn't affect the arteries, the, the organ arteries, so brain, kidney, heart. It affects more the peripheral vasculature. All right, we're going to skip that one. OK, so um, the, a number of things can go wrong with the conduction system of the heart. Um, and we're not going to go into a big, long, you know, how to read an EKG and what EKG findings mean. But basically, the, the rhythm abnormalities um, break down into just a few categories. So bradycardia, heart speeding too slow. Tachycardia, heart speeding too fast. Atrial flutter, this is where the atria, instead of contracting and relaxing and contracting and relaxing, they're just kind of quivering. Um, so atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation are very hard to discriminate against, but, um, or discriminate the two. But uh, atrial flutter can reduce cardiac output. Fibrillation is where some part of the heart is just kind of quivering as opposed to contracting and relaxing. PVCs are contractions that start somewhere other than the SA node. Um, and some people, you know, lots of people, have PVCs um, without uh, other heart disease. So like, you know, if, if you really like your coffee or you really like your caffeine, Chances are you throw a few PVCs from time to time, but it doesn't usually cause any harm unless they're consistent. A bundle branch block um, is uh, uh, delayed conduction in either one or both of the, um, the branches that go down into the ventricles. Heart blocks are where the top of the heart and the bottom of the heart are not in, in sync. Um, so there's a, a primary, a secondary, and then a total. Um, uh, heart block. All right. 
So just some examples. This is normal sinus rhythm. In a normal EKG, there should be a P wave, a QRS, and a T. And there should be one of those for every single complex. You know, so P, QRS, T. This one's normal. Here, OK, it's faster, but we still have a P, a QRS, and a T. It's just the P and T are kind of blending together there, which happens when your heart rate gets real high. So this would be a tachycardia, but otherwise normal. Sinus, the sinoatrial node is where uh, heartbeats usually begin. So anything that says sinus, that's, it started at the right place. Here we have a good example of um, a third degree or a complete heart block. You can see P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, but there's not really any association with the QRS complex. And that's because the atria are beating at one rate and the ventricles are beating at a much slower rate. So this is what happens when there's a disconnect between the atrial side of the heart and the ventricular side. And this, this rhythm here is always cause for concern. This is ventricular fibrillation. This is the heart isn't really doing anything productive at all. It is just kind of quivering um, and depolarizing and repolarizing. Uh, when a patient has this rhythm, they don't really have a cardiac output. So this is uh, one of the shockable rhythms. You know, if you hook somebody up to a, a monitor and you see this, first you check the leads because that's the most common reason to get a screwy pattern like this. But if the leads are good, you know, you, you call for the paddles because uh, this patient is on their way out. All right. So the, the various uh, dysrhythmias um, have a variety of different treatments. First and foremost, you should determine what the cause of the arrhythmia is um, and fix that cause if you can. So it might be anatomic, the patient's having an MI. It might be functional, they're having angina, so there's ischemia. Heart muscle doesn't have to die to start uh, behaving strangely. So you can get an arrhythmia with just um, angina, with ischemia. Could be metabolic. You know, we talked about these in our electrolytes uh, chapter, how potassium high or low can cause arrhythmias. Some of the medicines we give um, can trigger arrhythmias. Beta blockers, digitalis, which is also called digoxin, a very common heart medicine. Um, Potassium supplements uh, or, or treatment for high potassium can trigger uh, dysrhythmias. There are a number of drugs that will help with an arrhythmia. You know, beta blockers there again, calcium channel blockers, digoxin is commonly used. Um, if the problem is that the SA node is sick or broken, uh, then the patient needs a pacemaker, which is basically an, an external SA node. Remember, the SA node is what starts the contraction cycle, the conduction cycle. So here's what this nifty little device looks like. And there's a little flat disc that has a battery in it. These have gotten very advanced. That Now they have a computer in it, too. So like if your cardiologist wants to check on your pacemaker, you hold the telephone up to your chest, and uh, it can, the cardiologist can talk to the pacemaker over the phone. There's a wire that goes into the uh, subclavian vein. It goes down through the, um, uh, the right atrium and sort of sits here in the apex of the heart. And it will send a signal every few seconds to make the heart uh, start to contract. So pacemakers are sort of cool. All right. So you've had a big MI, half your heart, or not half, but a quarter of your heart muscle is dead. In other words, it's not contracting anymore. You know, what's going to happen? Well, when the heart can't keep up with what the body needs, that's congestive heart failure. So essentially, it's pump failure. You know, the heart is a pump. It's supposed to pump enough blood around to move the oxygen that the body needs and to get rid of the waste products. Um, so typically, the reason for the pump failure is that the stroke volume is too low. You know, a, a young, healthy heart, when it contracts, it almost completely empties. But if you've had an MI and that uh, ventricle contracts, it doesn't completely empty. There's always some blood left in the heart at the end of each contraction. So usually, it's the, the stroke volume is low. So the body sees a decrease in cardiac output. Specifically, the kidneys, which are very sensitive to oxygen, when they don't get enough oxygen, the assumption from the kidney is that there isn't enough blood volume. So 
one of the themes of congestive heart failure is that the body's reactions actually make the problem worse. You know, typically, you know, before modern medicine, if you had an MI, you would probably have died. You know, so all of this, you know, evolutionary time uh, so far, people don't live with broken hearts, you know, with hearts that are, that are damaged like this. So the body's evolutionary uh, compensation mechanisms often make things worse, which makes it very hard to treat congestive heart failure because you're always fighting the body's own responses. So it, it ends up being uh, quite uh, complicated medicine, you know, cascade of trouble, I heard uh, in, in medical school. All right. Um, so when the body sees this low cardiac output, it responds with vasoconstriction to try to keep the blood pressure up because hopefully those of you that had me for uh, physiology or anatomy will remember that cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. And then blood pressure, which is what makes blood flow through the body, is cardiac output times total peripheral resistance, right? So if the pump is failing, we have a decrease in cardiac output, which uh, is a decrease in blood pressure. So what the body does in response to eliminate that, it increases total peripheral resistance. Now the problem there is, now the heart, which is already weak, or it wouldn't, it wouldn't be having a problem in the first place, has to pump against more resistance. So in, in the effort to maintain blood pressure, the, um, the body is making the heart, which is already broken, work even harder. So you can imagine that that would have a tendency to make things worse. The other inappropriate um, uh, response is that a low blood pressure causes a reduction in uh, flow of blood, particularly at the kidney. And when your heart is normal, the only time this happens is when your plasma volume is low. In other words, when you don't have enough circulating volume of blood to carry everything around. So the kidney's response to this low flow is to increase plasma volume. Well, if you increase plasma volume, you have increased the workload of the heart again, because now there's more blood for the already weak heart to have to pump around the system. So we have this kind of double whammy of uh, inappropriate responses. This one causes an increase in workload. workload. And this response of the body also increases workload. Both of those things further challenge the heart and have a tendency to drive stroke volume down even more. So it's sort of a vicious cycle that can go, you know, round and round. So this is a pretty good, if not messy, uh, picture right from your book. And it's uh, looking at the, the different aspects of uh, congestive heart failure. Okay, so we've had our MI up here. Loss of heart muscle. Loss of heart muscle means loss of uh, contraction strength or ability. A drop in stroke volume, so a drop in cardiac output. So we're not going to look at these yet. We're going to look at these. So how does the body respond? Sympathetic nervous system is stimulated to increase total peripheral resistance. Um, that increases the workload of the heart. And then at the kidney, the low flow triggers the release of renin. And renin goes to angiotensin, which goes to aldosterone, increases plasma volume, which also increases workload. So. For a time, these compensatory mechanisms can support cardiac output, but the heart is not, it, now it has more work to do and it was already weak to begin with. So typically what happens is either the left side or the right side fails first. So if the left side fails first, the left ventricle doesn't completely empty, blood backs up into the pulmonary circulation, so you get pulmonary congestion, where you have lots of fluid and extra, uh, uh, basically extra blood in the lungs. That means that it's harder for the right ventricle to pump blood through the lungs. Because essentially, you know, let's say you know, your infarct was in the left. It backs up into the lungs. At some point, the right heart is going to have to start doing the work of the left heart, or everything's just going to back up. 
and the right ventricle can't do that. It only evolved to pump, you know, half or uh, to the lungs, not to the body. <clears throat> so eventually the right ventricle weakens and then we get right-sided failure. So we're going to compare the two left and right-sided uh, heart failures in a minute. So how do we intervene? Well, our interventions are to try to block these compensation mechanisms. So like we might give uh, alpha blockers and vasodilators to try to drop that total peripheral resistance, make it easier for the heart to create blood pressure. Um, beta blockers, uh, which might seem counterintuitive, you know, a beta blocker reduces uh, how uh, strong the heart pumps. And you might think, well, why would we want to do that when the heart isn't pumping strong enough in the first place? And the reason for it is that it's trying to pump, um, it's, uh, we have to reduce the workload on the heart or it's going to wear out. So essentially we want to slow it down and like have it, you know, be nice and, and ginger about what it's doing so it'll last longer. Digoxin is a great medicine because it actually increases the contraction strength of the heart without requiring it to uh, use more energy. Um, and then ACE inhibitors and diuretics work on this part, the increase in plasma volume that also gives the heart more work to do. So uh, it, CHF is all about the compensation mechanisms and how they're problematic. All right. So depending on where the injury to the heart was, either the left side is going to fail first and lead to right-sided failure, or the right side is going to fail first and lead to left-sided failure. So up here, we have left-sided congestive heart failure. So a weak left ventricle pumps less blood um, out to the body, and um, consequently, the blood that is returning from the lungs doesn't all get pumped out. So just like a clogged drain in your, uh, in your sink, it backs up into the lungs. So the clogged drain here is the left ventricle. Blood is not leaving the left ventricle as fast as blood is entering. You know, so uh, uh, blood coming back from the lungs is, um, it backs up into the lungs essentially. So you get pulmonary uh, congestion. Eventually, this will increase the pressure of blood in the lungs because it's backed up. And now the right ventricle won't be able to pump against that increased pressure, so the left-sided failure becomes right-sided failure. So that's the left side first. If it's the right side that had the heart attack or the right side that failed first, then the first things that we see are a backup into the body. So we'll see things like ascites or fluid in the abdomen. We'll, we'll uh, get a big liver. We'll get uh, venous stasis as the blood kind of pools in the dependent areas because the right heart can't pump it to the lungs fast enough or as fast as blood is returning to the heart. <clears throat> so eventually, uh, just like up here, um, the right-sided failure is going to lead to a left-sided failure because now uh, the, the blood is, is backing up not getting enough to the lungs, and eventually the left ventricle is trying to pump blood through the body and the lungs, and of course it can't do that. It's not strong enough, so it fails. So the bottom line is left-sided failure leads to right-sided failure. Right-sided failure leads to left-sided failure. So either way. So given that, you know, uh, uh, what we basically try to do is prevent the heart failure from cascading out of control, which is why we sort of block all the different compensation mechanisms. All right. This just compares the left and right side. Um, the biggest difference in symptoms are this last line here, backup effects. <clears throat> because otherwise, many of these symptoms are uh, shared in common or characteristics between left and right-sided failure. So in left-sided failure, there are lung symptoms. So orthopnea, this is where patients, when they lay flat on their back, can't breathe. And the reason that they can't breathe is all that extra fluid in the lungs that's backed up is laying flat, so it's taking up a lot of the lung tissues. The classic patient, patient presentation of this is, I'm having to sit up in my chair to sleep at night, which is a classic orthopnea thing, because patients figure out what works for them. And they'll say, yeah, I haven't slept flat in bed for a year. Uh-oh. Um, so that's orthopnea. 
Um, cough, shortness of breath, um, nocturnal dyspnea, again, when you're laying flat, that uh, increases the pressure in the lungs. And then hemoptysis. The classic picture for left-sided failure is frothy pink secretions being coughed up. So frothy pink stuff uh, in the um, uh, being coughed up is uh, pulmonary congestion or pulmonary edema until proven otherwise. Right-sided failure is all about the body, um, the rest of the body. <clears throat> so we have edema in the feet, big liver, big spleen. Ascites is a very common one, and ascites makes abdomens big and round. How can you tell the difference between a beer belly and ascites? It's how it sounds. Um, ascites is all fluid. So if you tap on their abdomen, it sounds like a drum in ascites because it's all just fluid. It's, the sound just bounces around in there. Um, and then uh, red flushed faces. You know, basically the blood can't get out of the uh, systemic circulation and into the lungs, so it backs up. So people get very ruddy, very deep red. Um, headache, distended neck veins are also. So left-sided and right-sided congestive heart failure. So how do we treat it? Well, we treat the cause when we can, but like in an MI, we can't treat the cause. So we end up having to deal with the broken heart and try to, um, uh, you know, balance things as well as we can. Um, and as we said, uh, or as I said, preventing compensations is a big thing. Heart healthy diet and exercise. This is one of the reasons we put people on cardiac rehab. If you strengthen the rest of the heart, you can stop this whole cycle from happening because stroke volume then never drops. So we want to get patients who've had MIs into a training regimen early on. And then the medications we already talked about. Fluid and salt restrictions are very common in congestive heart failure and patients hate them. So they try any little way they can to get around them. So it's one of those things that you'll have very angry patients with you sometimes when you say, nope, that's all the water you can have right now. And what we're trying to do there is block this compensation mechanism. If we, give, if we restrict their fluid, their plasma volume doesn't go up, and that means the heart has less blood to pump around, which is a good thing for a heart that's struggling to keep up. All right. Um, and I just said treatment is often a balancing act. It's why uh, one of the nice things about having cardiologists in the world is that most of us don't have to come up with these treatment regimens. We just have to take care of the patients who are on them um, because it can be a real challenge figuring out what this particular patient needs and what works for them. All right. So that's congestive heart failure, usually the result of MIs, although it can be the result of other things like um, valve defects. Um, sometimes you can have uh, 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 metabolic derangements that make the heart not work as well, but typically it's MIs. So heart valves can essentially have three different problems, or two, two different problems. Anyway, we'll, we'll keep it simple. Two problems. So they can either be a stenosis, it's hard for blood to pass through that heart valve, or there can be an incompetence. The valve doesn't do its job. You know, what a heart valve is supposed to do is allow blood to flow through in the right direction very easily, but allow no blood to flow backwards. So no backflow. In a stenosis, the, uh, for whatever reason, when the valve opens, it's too narrow. So it's hard for blood to pass through those. You need more pressure to push blood through it, and more pressure means more work for the heart. But there's no backflow. So this is a forward flow problem, um, a valve stenosis. The, the heart has to push harder, and it doesn't move as much blood. In the incompetent valve, blood flows forward very easily, but when it tries to move backwards, it's allowed back through that valve. So the valve is leaky. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, they just give you one example, aortic stenosis. So this, the aortic valve, which is right here, is too small. So the left ventricle has to pump harder to get any blood to move through there. It makes a murmur because it, goes, uh, it has to uh, push through, so it's turbulent. So we hear kind of a on uh, when we listen to their chest. Um, that's what the squiggly lines are, is the sound that you hear. 
And then oftentimes, if a valve is stenotic, it'll cause uh, a backup into the, the chamber before it. Because if blood can't get out, well, where is it going to end up? It's going to end up backing up, and the atria isn't going to be able to um, uh, completely empty. So two basic problems with uh, uh, one is too narrow, increase in workload. The other is uh, not functioning. This also increases the work of the heart. Because for every ml of blood that goes backwards, that's an ml that has to be pumped forwards again. So the heart has to work you know, some percentage harder to move the same amount of blood because the valves aren't working. All right. And I skipped some things about congenital heart disease and uh, some details that I, that I don't think are um, you know, at this uh, course's level. So um, if I skipped it, uh, then... Uh, you know, it's, it's not going to appear um, on the exam. All right. Infective endocarditis, typically just called endocarditis or bacterial endocarditis. Well, endo is inside, carditis is heart, right? So this is a inflammation inside the heart. Specifically, this is infection of the heart valves or the endocardium. There's two varieties. There's subacute. Um, which uh, is sometimes very difficult to treat because it doesn't present a lot of symptoms. So the patients come in with not very many problems. Um, and this is usually because of defective heart valves. So heart valves that have been damaged somehow, like by rheumatic fever or um, uh, prolonged hypertension, things like that. When the heart valves are damaged, they become increased uh, risk of infection. Um, in acute endocarditis, this is where normal heart valves are attacked by particularly nasty uh, blood-borne uh, bacteria like Staph aureus. Um, so these can cause severe tissue damage. Acute endocarditis can destroy heart valves. So it's one of the reasons why people need to have heart valves replaced sometimes. Um, in addition to these problems, which either of these two can result in, because uh, you know we can put in fake valves now, mechanical valves that solve these problems. In endocarditis, what happens is you end up getting a little colony of bacteria on these valves, and it makes what's called a vegetation, which is sort of a fuzzy, furry thing hanging off the valve. And you can imagine that a valve that's supposed to be nice and smooth, if it gets this little fuzzy, furry thing on it, well, it's not going to function as well. Um, so you get inflammation and scarring in the valves. That can lead to valve dysfunction, like stenosis, an injured valve doesn't move as easily, so it becomes stenotic, um, or uh, regurgitation if it gets uh, too floppy. Usually in infective endocarditis, there's some risk factor. Normal healthy people don't usually get endocarditis, um, but people who are immune compromised do. It's seen in HIV, for example. Uh, people who have damaged or artificial heart valves. Artificial valves are not as good at fighting infection as the original valves are. And then IV drug use. Usually on board exams, endocarditis is related or is there's some indication that the uh, patient might be an IV drug user. Yeah. Is the reason most people don't get it, is there like a vaccine there's not. It's just normally the heart valves are, you know, uh, they're intact. They resist infection. So there's always something else that's going on. Unless you happen to have a particularly nasty sepsis where you have Staph aureus in the blood. Yeah. Um, treatment is hard. You know, these, uh, these heart valves are really connective tissue. You know, they're, they're flaps of tissue. They don't have like a robust blood supply or um, a, a fast regeneration. So one of the differences with endocarditis compared to other infections is you have to treat with long-term antibiotics, you know, like months and months and months of antibiotics um, in order to uh, get rid of that infection. And then if you've had endocarditis once, it means you are at an increased risk to have it again. So. It's one of the times that we will treat patients with prophylactic antibiotics, as if they have a his history of endocarditis. When they go to have their teeth worked on or they go to have some minor surgery, we put them on a short course of antibiotics to prevent those bacteria from uh, taking hold in the heart again. All right. Pericarditis uh, is inflammation of the pericardium. 
You'll hopefully remember from anatomy that the heart sits in this leather-like sac that separates it from the rest of the mediastinum or that center part of the chest. That sac normally uh, has just a small amount of fluid in it and then um, uh, the heart inside. Um, it's, um, you know, it looks sort of like this. So if, if this is the heart, the pericardial sac kind of goes like this and then part of it is attached to the outermost surface of the heart. So in between those, we have a space. So that's the pericardial space. Typically, that space only has a small amount of slippery fluid in it, um, just enough to allow the heart to move uh, separately from what it's attached to. In a pericarditis, though, it's this uh, heart sac that is uh, inflamed. So this can be from infection. It can be autoimmune. It can be traumatic. You know, if a gunshot wound, for example, that, say, grazed the heart, blood in the pericardium, from that bleeding, um, can uh, it irritates the pericardium. Um, an effusion can develop. This is where the pericardial sac ends up with fluid in it. That fluid um, can have a variety of characteristics. It can be serous, in other words, watery, fibrinous, sticky, um, purulent. If it's an infection, you'll get pus in that pericardial sac. Um, and if a large amount of effusion is present, this sac doesn't stretch. It's, it's tough, you know, like very thick leather. So if you get a lot of fluid in here, the fluid starts to push against the heart, which makes it, you know, it's basically squeezing the heart closed. So a pericardial effusion typically is not, it doesn't appear all by itself. It appears in relation to something else. Um, you know, a bad pneumonia, a bad sepsis, um, trauma of some kind, an MI can result in a pericarditis. All right. So uh, inflammation of the pericardium. Okay. So that's sort of heart stuff in a nutshell. Um, the most complicated of which is the uh, uh, congestive heart failure. And in some ways, the hardest to remember part of it is all the congenital heart defects, which you noticed that we just walked right over the top of because it's, uh, it's just too complicated to get into. But the other part of the cardiovascular system is the vessels. So um, arterial disease, the most common is hypertension. Hypertension just means a high blood pressure. Usually we're referring to systolic blood pressure when we talk about hypertension. There's two broad categories. Um, essential hypertension or primary hypertension is what we're going to talk about. Um, and it is a, it's not caused by something else is all that means. Primary hypertension is uh, a disease all by itself. Because there are a number of diseases that will cause hypertension secondarily. So like kidney diseases are infamous for this. And that's because the kidney plays a major role in blood pressure management. So when the kidney gets sick, the blood pressure gets sick. Um, endocrine, um, uh, uh, anything that causes like the thyroid hormone to be elevated or um, the release of adrenaline or noradrenaline from the adrenal gland, those will cause uh, hypertension. For example, a pheochromocytoma is a tumor that gets looked for often but is rarely found. Um, and it, we just call it a pheo. A pheo is basically a tumor that secretes adrenaline or a tumor that secretes epinephrine. So in a patient who presents suddenly with elevated blood pressure, you know, in other words, it's, they haven't had increasing blood pressure over the last five years, they suddenly have a blood pressure of 180 over 100. That's one of the things we'll look for is to see if it's a, a pheochromocytoma. Um, and then the third category is malignant or resistant hypertension. This is hypertension that's exceedingly difficult to treat. So on three or more medications, the patient is still having hypertension. Um, typically, in this malignant version, the diastolic pressures are very high, which is more of a problem than high systolic pressures. The higher your diastolic pressure, the more work the heart has to do just to open the aortic valve. So it has a tendency to uh, lead to congestive heart failure. This uh, malignant version does. But essential hypertension, 
the key, you know, if somebody says, uh, you know, what causes idiopathic hypertension? Well, the bottom line is that for whatever reason, the patient has an elevated total peripheral resistance. An elevated total peripheral resistance means an elevated blood pressure from our equation that cardiac output is, uh, or blood pressure is cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. Typically, um, this elevated, uh, and this is where the cascade starts. So the patient's TPR is too high. Now, why is that? We don't know. Some people dial up their, blood, their uh, total peripheral resistance too high, and it causes elevated blood pressure. When this goes up, that leads to um, a decrease in flow at the kidney. And since the kidneys are very sensitive to a decrease in blood flow, any decrease in blood flow at the kidney gets the kidney to try to increase plasma volume. Okay, now here's where the nasty cycle comes in. An increase in plasma volume has a tendency to increase cardiac output, which also increases blood pressure. So you can see that you have one of these vicious cycles. Patient's TPR is too high, low blood flow to the kidney. That causes the patient to hold on to fluid and uh, be more thirsty. So it's fluid retention that expands plasma volume, which increases stroke volume, which increases cardiac output, which further increases blood pressure. So the, uh, the two uh, targets for controlling blood pressure are to try to knock this out. So try to lower, turn that up into a down. Lower total peripheral resistance. Um, lower plasma volume. So, you know, take that out. Uh, the kidney's response. Or to directly lower cardiac output um, with... Uh, uh, Various medications. What? No, the first thing is usually this one. They put them on diuretics first oh, to try okay. to lower the plasma volume. Like fluid restriction, like that's not going to be good. Okay. No, no, no. They it's they don't tr they uh, try to get them on diuretics. Um, ACE inhibitors attack this spot here too. Um, beta blockers uh, try to lower cardiac output and lower total peripheral resistance. And some of the alpha blockers, calcium channel blockers work there. So those are the three main places. Is they attack total peripheral resistance, plasma volume, or cardiac output. Why? Because high blood pressures damage uh, arterials or, or arteries, particularly endothelial cells, and can trigger that whole atherosclerosis thing that we talked about already. Another uh, risk uh, for hypertension is, let's skip here, is one of these. High blood pressure can cause the aortic wall to sort of half rupture. You know, damage over a long term um, can uh, cause the wall to be weak here. So pressure goes in and it basically pushes out. And eventually you can get what's called a dissecting aneurysm where basically the aortic wall is tearing itself apart. And you can imagine that this might not be compatible with life for very long. Um, so it's one of the reasons that we treat uh, hypertension. All right. Uh, so we kind of already talked about this. Decreased blood flow, increased renin circulation. Okay. Onward. Um, so treatment for essential hypertension is stepwise. We, we start simple. Lifestyle changes lower the sodium. Lower sodium means lower plasma volume. Increase exercise. That helps to fix the original problem, which is an elevated total peripheral resistance. But ultimately, a lot of patients end up on medications, and it's very individualized. You know, we can start with an algorithm for treating hypertension, but people tend to diversify pretty quickly because what works for one person doesn't work for another. Um, so at first, especially, there's a lot of dialing in, you know, finding that right uh, medication choice. But the common ones that are used, diuretics affect plasma volume. ACE inhibitors actually affect this and this uh, because of angiotensin. Calcium channel blockers work on the heart as well as total peripheral resistance. Um, and, uh, and then beta blockers work directly on the heart, too. 
Okay, a little bit about PVD. Peripheral vascular disease is any abnormality of the arteries or veins outside of the heart. So it's anywhere else. Now, what we typically see is problems in the distal uh, blood vessels, particularly in the um, uh, legs and feet. Atherosclerosis affects all arteries in the body, typically. Uh, so anywhere that atherosclerosis is, and you're going to have a reduction in blood supply. So anywhere you see that pattern, atheroma, there's going to be a reduced flow on the other side of that. So if you have atherosclerosis in your iliac arteries, let's say, the arteries that supply your legs, it means the amount of blood going to your legs is going down all the time. Well, that's going to cause problems when you reach the point that the amount of blood can no longer supply the tissues of your legs. So your muscles, uh, the skin there. Hmm? Is this in veins and arteries? No, typically it's arteries we talk about, yeah. But peripheral vascular disease is a big category. Like it would include um, uh, venous clots are also peripheral vascular disease. But your book really talks about the arterial side of it. So the signs and symptoms, this one that's uh, italicized is the, the classic board presentation. Intermittent claudication. This is leg pain associated with exercise. And it's due to ischemia. Because of this reduction in blood flow because of atherosclerosis, when you go to walk up the steps is the classic one. Um, you know, your calf muscles demand a lot more oxygen because they're working. But the... Uh, the uh, cardiovascular system can't provide them any more uh, blood flow because it's all restricted going down there. So intermittent claudication is pain, usually in the, um, in the calves or feet, with exertion. Usually it goes away with rest, not because the muscles are, are, uh, have gotten better. You know, it's not a muscular injury, it's a vascular problem. When you rest, the flow uh, can now keep up with the demand uh, for oxygen. Sensory impairment goes along with this. Numbness and tingling becomes just numbness. Um, and that's because inadequate blood flow kills off the neurons and it uh, makes the, uh, the skin much less sensitive. Eventually, the feet and legs get very pale and cyanotic. When they're, uh, when they're dangling, they get very red because they have, um, you know, uh, blood is pooling down there. Diagnosis is usually by a Doppler study. You know, we can look at the arteries and veins in the legs much more directly than we can in the heart. We can just use the Doppler probe to see uh, the motion through those. The goal for uh, vascular disease treatment is to slow the progression. You know, we can't go in there and roto-root all of the atheromas out of the vascular system. It would be far too invasive. It would cause more harm than good. But we can try to keep it from getting worse and uh, you know, it, uh, get you uh, as much exercise tolerance as possible so you can do as much as you can. So you'll see that some of these are uh, the same as for atherosclerosis, like reduced cholesterol, platelet inhibitors, anticoagulants, stop smoking, increase uh, exercise, um, uh, keep the, uh, the legs dependent, in other words, down towards the ground. So this is a person you wouldn't want them to elevate their feet. You know, you'd want them even depressed a little to try to help that flow through the obstruction to get down to the feet um, and back up. Um, and then peripheral vasodilators like calcium channel blockers to try to make this artery as big as possible to have that atheroma not matter as much. So then these people don't ever, I guess... I'm trying to combine this with like edema, like uh -huh. like diabetics. They have really bad peripheral vascular disease. Right. Not only they have like horrible edema, but then they'll have pores that they're saying they're not taking any nutrients or oxygen to too. Right. So like is that the combination of this? And it is because remember, it's not, not just like really vicious cycle. It's not just blood that you need. You need fresh blood. Right. You know, you need oxygenated blood. So it is. You get the you get old deoxygenated nasty blood that sits down there and has no nutrients in it, but it also causes edema, which infection likes to live in. Right. Take so that together 
with the neurologic problems and you've got you've got feet that are falling apart and the patient can't do anything about and then, it. Like, you know, to elevate, like that's still not getting in the nutrients that they're gonna need to help. Exactly, because it's not getting so blood. Got so much swelling. Yeah. So a good way to think is you've got nutrient deficiency problems and you've got waste removal problems both in the diabetic with peripheral it's vascular disease. It is hard to fix. You, that's why we try to uh, treat diabetes early. All right, we're out of time, folks. Whew. So enjoy your uh, fall break.